While SPV3 is a gigantic project, it started off with a very simple objective, and that was to innovate the sandbox and expand on what Halo 1 did without replicating the feel of another Halo game. While at first may appear to just be Halo 1 with more stuff, it was always the goal of this project to add extra layers of complexity to Halo 1's sandbox while retaining what made that first game so much fun to play. The sandbox needed to be good enough to make players want to replay this 20 year old game. There are nearly 40 weapons dispersed through SPV3, and while going over each one would be outside the scope of this video, I'm going to try to break it down as simply as I can into how we organize these into different categories. It's important to note that just because we have 40 weapons doesn't mean you'll encounter 40 weapons in a single map. Two Betrayals, which has the most amount of weapons in it in both SPV3 and the original game, has 23 weapons in our mod. However, five of those are encountered only once or twice throughout the mission. Ultimately, we average out to have about as many active weapons in a mission as Halo 3 or 4. However, we tend to focus more on the Covenant and Forerunner side when it comes to expanding weaponry than the human arsenal. Halo 1 only has about 8 weapons, each with a very specific function and use. And if you were to add a weapon, or remove any of those, it would fundamentally change the game. And with us wanting to add more weapons to the game, this was an enormous challenge to even just figure out as to how to do it correctly. What we ended up doing is taking these 8 different weapons and breaking them down into smaller subcategories. We also looked at player trends and how they like to use human weapons over any sort of alien weapon. What ultimately ended up happening is we broke down the traditional roles of weapons on the human side into subcategories. The original pistol, for instance, was split into four different weapons. The new version of the pistol, the battle rifle, the DMR, and, to an extent, the Covenant Particle Carbine. Each of these weapons has their own learning curve, and each has their own situational advantages in the sandbox. Since there is no multiplayer component to SPV3, the delta between these roles could be larger than any other Halo game. We don't actually balance these weapons against each other as much as we try to develop situations where players would want to learn how to use them. The three human weapons are given introductions on Pillar of Autumn, with the Covenant Particle Carbine being introduced on the mission Halo. Every area in which we introduce one of these weapons is accompanied by an encounter that introduces you to some of the more unique aspects of this weapon compared to the ones you have used prior. To summarize these four weapons in a nutshell, the pistol has eight rounds and is very accurate, but can be fired rapidly at a cost of accuracy in order to take down shields of elites at close range or to quickly do damage to brutes. The battle rifle has very weak bullets and fires in three round bursts unzoomed, but is not very effective at depleting overshields or body health. When in zoom, it can fire single shots, which travel through the air rather slowly compared to the DMR and sniper rifle. Players who lead their shots will be able to effectively take out grunts while not expending as much ammo. The DMR can output the most damage per clip, but the slow rate of fire, bloom, and low auto aim values make it very difficult to use in frenetic situations. The Particle Carbine is essentially a heat-based version of the Halo 4 Carbine. Players who pace their shots will never have to reload it. Also, since it's plasma-based, it has some unique properties versus shields. If players spam the gun fast enough, they can deplete an elite's energy shield, but then they have to figure out what they're going to do while their gun cools down. This leads to some great player behaviors and thinking, as they have to react on their feet to the situation at the time. With the branching of the pistol and other weapons that went through a similar process, players must do a cost-benefit analysis of the weapons they're presented with, and as they get more experience throughout the game, they do these decisions faster on the fly. However, this strategy could only be really applied to the human weapons. Covenant weapons needed to first and foremost present an interesting challenge for the player to combat. We always looked at why would this weapon be fun to fight against when introducing a new Covenant weapon, and what challenge or obstacle does it provide to the player. The secondary consideration was what role does it play in the sandbox and why does a player want to use it. In the original game, it's pretty simple. The plasma pistol is good for longer range and for the overcharge. The plasma rifle is good for rapid fire and spraying lots of plasma at enemies to deplete their shields. The needler is good for players of poor aim and also allows grunts to be basically turned into bombs. For SPV3, we have 15 different covenant weapons that the wield, and that the player can use. While overlap is inevitable, there are practical applications for the usage of each one. The only exception to this would be the brute plasma rifle. The inclusion of this weapon was mainly done just so the brutes are distinct when they're firing at you from the elites. Also, since brutes appear in greater numbers than elites in an encounter, it helps cut down on projectile spam. Since in our project, the brute plasma rifle has a lower rate of fire. Generally speaking, covenant weapons excel at certain tasks, but are very ineffective at other ones. We almost treat them as tools for players who are less experienced with SPV3 or more casual gamers. As they play more SPV3 and understand the meta of the mechanics, they will start to gravitate to other weapons to accomplish their tasks. Speaking of other main mechanics, there's two other things that we added which are largely unpopular among classic Halo fans. One of those is loadouts, and the other are armor abilities, which include sprint. We added these because we thought they were fundamentally sound ideas, and even though some people may disagree on the application of them in other games, 
The concept in itself is not bad, nor warrants exclusion. Loadouts have a terrible stigma attached to them, especially among fans of the older games. However, we saw loadouts as a way to get players to go back and revisit levels while using weapons or mechanics that would normally not be available to them on their prior playthrough. Sometimes this means spawning them without a headshot weapon. Other times it means giving them power weapons only, but with very limited ammo. Sometimes it means giving them a weapon with a silencer attached, or a grenade launcher to the bottom. Ultimately, it's all about expanding player choice each time they want to revisit these missions. And players uninterested in some of the customized weapons can just choose a traditional starting weapon set. When we looked at implementing armor abilities, we had a few core values in mind. The primary one was to never allow the armor abilities to slow the action and the pacing of the game. While we started with about 8 armor abilities, we ultimately ended up with 4 of them. The reasons are a long story, part technical, part gameplay wise. In the end, the 4 we chose all help accentuate certain pillars of the gameplay loop. Both the visor and upgrade to the motion tracker enhance the situational awareness of the player. Meanwhile, health regen lessens the impact of being wounded in a battle. It's essentially the Halo 2 and Onward health system, but instead of a player's health being fully healed after their shields recharge, only a fraction of it is. This encourages the player to have more close quarter battles without having to worry about being brought down to a single bar of red health. Then of course comes Sprint. Obviously Sprint enhances the player's mobility, but we also had to make it work with an existing level geometry. It's important to note that Sprint is not made available in all levels. But for those that it is, it actually is timed to only last as long as it would take for your shield to start to recharge. By timing it so specifically, a player who takes shield damage or even loses their shield and decides to sprint to get away will not be able to sprint endlessly until their shield is back. They can run to find cover or get out of the enemy's line of sight, but ultimately the player will have to engage the enemy as the sprint only lasts in 5 second spurts. We also added a form of Spartan Charge so that sprint could be used in offensive purposes as well. If a player melees an enemy while sprinting, the enemy would be thrown backwards depending on their weight. For enemies like Hunters, Brutes, and Elites, the force of the melee will only knock them backwards a little bit, but is effective in countering their own melee attacks. Grunts, Jackals, and Floodforms will be flung back an incredible amount of space. While difficult to do with Grunts, you can actually stick them with a plasma grenade and launch the exploding Grunt. Sprint also augments the player's ability to hijack vehicles by allowing them to close the gap faster. The way in which these four armor abilities augment the player behavior has worked fairly well for us. Like with the weapons, the player is constantly doing a cost-benefit analysis on the abilities they have on hand. How and why they should be using these abilities, plus being able to cater to different playstyles and demographics, means that there is an armor ability for all the different players' playstyles. While we didn't need to factor in support for multiplayer into any of our design decisions with SPV3, I don't see this as too big of an issue. Every Halo game, except for Halo 3, uses a different set of weapon values and properties for its multiplayer and single player. While I think it's important to have consistency between the two, a small deviation of weapon and player behavior is not the worst thing in the world. In fact, every Halo game that has tried to have parity between the multiplayer and the single player in terms of sandbox has later walked back that decision, except for Halo 3. However, with ODST, when they no longer had to factor in multiplayer into the sandbox design, they made some pretty sweeping changes. And while we didn't have to worry about a multiplayer, we did need to make sure that everything we did felt consistent with that that players have experienced over the past 20 years of playing Halo. Sometimes we see players confused as the weapons behaviors have changed between SPV3 and the other official games. This is an issue that happens with all games whenever they do a sequel and certain mechanics change. For me, what's important is the mechanics are executed as best as we can to retain the core feeling of Halo. And to me, that's the agency of player decisions, especially doing cost-benefit analysis on the fly. There are things that modern players expect and classic players want. Striking a balance between the two is something I think we've done really well in SPV3. And we would have gone further had the technology allowed us to do so. There are things we would have loved to do in certain missions. Jetpacks, thrusters, clambering. And these are all things I'd be interested in implementing or working with, given the right opportunity. 